I uh, want to welcome everybody to this week's happy hour session. Uh, before we get started and before uh, I introduce our hosts this week, uh, I wanted to remind everybody that uh, this coming Saturday, February 13th, we'll be uh, running uh, the discussion session for uh, our next or, or our most recent rollout of the Durham Path Core Exam Board Review. Uh, so hopefully a lot of you have been able to register for that if, you, if you're going to be sitting for the upcoming Durham Path Core Exam. <clears throat> if not, certainly not too late to register. Uh, the slides uh, and question sheet are uh, available for downloading and review now. And uh, we will be beginning that discussion uh, on the um, at 12 o'clock on the 13th. And for any uh, information on that, I would uh, uh, just uh, urge you to take a look at the uh, at our um, website. Um, our speaker this week, oh, and by the way, too, we will not be having a session next Monday, no happy hour next Monday, since we'll be having uh, our board review discussion on Saturday. Our happy hours will resume the week after, which I believe is the 22nd of February. And um, that week, Dr. Travis Vandergriff from UT Southwestern is going to be hosting the session. Uh, today, Dr. Trey Martin will be um, discussing the slides. Uh, there were a number of, I think, challenging um, entities this week, a number of soft tissue tumors, and I think you'll find Trey's discussion very helpful and uh, very good. Trey pre-recorded his session, so Cindy's going to go ahead and uh, start that. Uh, I'm going to keep the chat up, and uh, if you have any questions, I'll try to address those at the end of the session. If not, you can um, send your, any questions uh, to education at sagesdx.com, or you can email me directly, tdavis at sagesdx.com, or just call or text me at 210-416-4815. Uh, and Cindy put that data uh, in the chat for, for anybody who, who wants to take a photograph or, or write that down. So without any further hesitation, we'll go ahead and turn the session over to, to Dr. Martin. Great. Hello all, thanks for joining me in this Dermpath Happy Hour that Sages is sponsoring. Um, some of you all know me, I'm uh, Trey Martin, Dr. Martin, and I'm a partner here at Sages. I've done uh, a couple of these happy hours and have enjoyed it very much, and I, I hope you all will enjoy this one. Um, today we're gonna be looking at some uh, uh, fibrous lesions and some spindle cell lesions, and so basically sarcomas and fiber histiocytic lesions, and these can be very challenging. And I don't want you to be frustrated because some of these, there's absolutely no way you can know the diagnosis prior without using um, immunostains. So, so you may not have the diagnosis, but a lot of these, it's going to be differentials and how to think through it. So I always like to um, begin um, begin a sarcoma lecture with talking about, you know, how we classify neoplasia and, and why this can be somewhat difficult. And, and essentially, we, we classify neoplasms based on their cell of derivation and um, and also in, in many ways what they're trying to what structures they're trying to recapitulate in the normal body so um, and what function they're trying to perform so for sarcomas you know for instance if it's a um, if it's a neoplasm that's trying to to form fatty tissue then it would be a, a liposarcoma um, or if it's benign, a lipoma. So you have malignant and benign counterparts for each. So um, if it's trying to trying to form smooth muscle, then the benign lesion would be the leiomyoma. The malignant lesion would be the leiomyosarcoma. You know, if it's trying to form striated muscle, then the benign lesion would be a rhabdomyoma, and the, and the malignant one would be a rhabdomyosarcoma. And so this goes on and on. And you can do this with sarcomas. You can do this with lymphomas, you can do this with um, carcinomas. So, you know, that's the framework you need to be thinking about pathology. And, and, you know, sometimes you can get the answer based on histology alone. And sometimes you need ancillary studies to try to figure out what these cells are and, and what they're trying to do or what function they're trying to perform that allows us to classify them. And essentially the ultimate goal of classifying is to render a prognosis for a lesion 
on the spectrum of benign to malignant. And unfortunately, some you can't classify as benign or malignant. They're kind of in between, and um, they may they may be in in the midst of transforming into a more malignant lesion, or they may be of undetermined malignant potential, et cetera, et cetera. Not to say that those are diagnoses per se, but we're trying to classify these to basically give a prognosis to the patient for a mass that they have. All right. So, you know, if you think about it in that, those terms, it, it's, it's, it's a little easier to wrap your head around some of these lesions and to not get so frustrated when um, um, it's difficult to determine if they're absolutely benign or absolutely malignant or whatnot. So I guess we can just dive in and begin. So I'm going to start the screen sharing now with the path presenter and get to that. There we go. Let's see if I can make this a little easier to see for everybody. There we go. So this is case one. And on low power, we have basically a scoop shave or a, 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 you know, a, pretty, a pretty generous shave biopsy um, of a lesion that uh, is really centered here in the dermis with minimal epidermal um, or actually no epidermal involvement. And we really can't see it arising from the epidermis. So if it's arising from the epidermis, that gives us a clue as to what it might be, but it's unfortunately not talking to us in that way in this case. And when we go down, we basically see nondescript spindled cells with a background of lymphocytes and even some eosinophils here. You can see, I thought I saw it. Yeah, there's one right here. Right, there's an eosinophil right there. Um, and here's some more up here. Not that that means much, I'm just, just to identify the cells. So. So basically we have a nondescript spindle cell lesion. And you know, you look at this as a pathologist or a dermatopathologist and you go, well, my goodness, what, what is this? What, what cells are these trying to be? Are these histiocytes? Are they lymphocytes that are spindled? Are they melanocytes that are spindled? Are they, are they smooth muscle cells that are spindled? You know, so we have to reach into our, our grab bag of ancillary studies to detect what these cells are. And, and in this case, that would be immunostains. So the differential here, and we'll need a differential to determine what immunostains we're going to use, would be any type of spindle cell lesion such as a melanoma, so a spindle cell melanoma. And a clue to that would be to look up in the epidermis for any melanoma in situ, which I don't see. This could be a, a, a carcinoma, either primary or metastatic. So, you know, a clue to that would be to see it dropping off or off of the epidermis, so the keratinocytes of the epidermis or, or a more differentiated squamous cell somewhere, which we don't see. Um, uh, we would have to be worried about a, um, a um, atypical fibrosanthoma, which is a term for a spindle cell pleomorphic lesion of the confined to the dermis where we can't figure out the derivation, quite frankly, but we know just from studying them that they tend to behave relatively indolently when confined to the dermis. So that's our differential. So basically we have to throw on cytokeratins to rule out our carcinoma. So that can be cytokeratin 81, 83. That can be um, low molecular weight cytokeratins. And I'm just saying these so that you can be some familiar with some of the terms such as CAM 5.2 or cytokeratin 818. Um, we, we can throw on P63, which is a great marker for, for carcinomas. Or it's a marker, marcinoma, uh, excuse me, a marker for um, oftentimes primary skin lesions, although it can be seen in metastatic lesions. Um, we would definitely want to throw on melanocyte markers here to make sure we're not dealing with a spindle cell melanoma. And um, so that would be SOX10, MART1, HMB45, MIT-F, those are some of the biggies, and S100, of course. So um, because often a spindle cell melanoma has lost MART and it's only S100 positive. So when we throw on the immunostains on this, lo and behold, it is cytokeratin positive. And I know that because I know I have the benefit of knowing the answer. And the answer to this one is a poorly differentiated sarcomatoid squamous cell carcinoma. So it would have been P63 and cytokeratin positives, all right, or cyto cytokeratins positive. And, you know, this is where I don't want you to get frustrated. <laughs> That's why I started off by saying, you know, some of these you just don't know the answer unless you have ancillary studies available. And this is a, an excellent example, but it's a great mental exercise in a differential for a spindle cell lesion. All right. So let's see if we can move on to case number two. 
get this straight. I kind of like to look at them straight. There we go. Okay, so case number two. Um, this is a um, this is another. We have expansion of the dermis by a spindle cell lesion here, very similar to the first one, and I think this is why the first one is valuable to look at, and because now we're seeing a spindle cell lesion down here with more plump spindled cells, and so what do we want to do? It's our same differential that we just went through. So let's look at our clues. Is it coming off of the epidermis? Do we see a carcinoma here somewhere, a squamous cell carcinoma? No, I don't. But what I do see is something right here in the epidermis. When we go down here, we see nests of melanocytes traveling far down a follicular unit. When we go to the surface epidermis, we see single melanocytes, both at the dermal epidermal junction and far above it. So there's our clue to what this is. So we have a melanoma in situ here, and then we have a spindle cell lesion under it. So our histologic clue here is this is a spindle cell melanoma. And other clues to this diagnosis that you might want to be aware of is it often goes deep, as you can see here, and it's often associated with balls of inflammation, like right here. And sometimes a big clue is it's associated with balls of inflammation down at the at the dermo at the excuse me the dermis subcutis junction so where the dermis meets the fat of the subcutis you'll see balls of inflammation and that's not great but that is a big clue often in some cases it's not great happening here excuse me let's see if i can get to the top one yeah there they are right there see these balls of inflammation right there at the junction of the dermis the subcutis when you start seeing that really in a spindle cell lesion start thinking of a spindle cell melanoma, and then head up to the epidermis and see if you can find a melanoma inside you. So that's, uh, that's case number two. Case number three. Oh my goodness, yet another spindle cell lesion in the dermis. So let's see if we can find some clues to this one. Well, we have this time Instead of just diffusely effacing the dermis, we, we have a basically a semi-circumscribed lesion right here that's beginning. So here's the dermis, and it's beginning right here. You can kind of draw a line around it, and then it just turns into sheets of spindled and, and slightly uh, epithelioid cells. You know, there's a moderate degree of atypia here, but it's, you know, it's kind of difficult to find some mitotic figures. You can find them when you look. Every once in a while, you see a um, you see a giant cell with some multinucleation, uh, which isn't rare in this tumor. Um, I, I I often like to go down deep into the, at the subcutis junction and see how it's interacting, like with the spindle cell melanoma, because a big clue to a lesion such as a dermatofibrosarcoma protuberans would be infiltration in a very net-like, you know infiltrating the subcutis. Um, unfortunately, in this biopsy, we don't have that because the tumor is so thick. So, you know, what, what's our differential? Well, well, it's not that atypical. So, you know, you might be thinking of a fibrous histiocytoma, a dermatofibroma, um, maybe a, you might briefly think of a neurofibroma. You might think of um, a dermatofibrosarcoma protuberans. And, and so now we're gonna have to go back, let's reach in our bag and grab out our immunostains and try to figure out what these cells are. And when we do, we find that it's diffusely and strongly CD34 positive. So this is a um, dermatofibrosarcoma protuberans. And there's a couple of take home lessons I would like to point out here. First of all, the lesion's kind of beginning right here. So the upper dermis is free, then here's the lesion, then it turns very cellular down here. But if you just do a shave biopsy, this top right here, you're going to come down here and it looks very much like the top of a dermatofibroma or the top of a neurofibroma. All right, so, so you really got to get deep with these if you're suspecting, uh, if you have a big mass clinically. And it would benefit us greatly to be able to see the subcutis here. Um, but it may have just completely effaced it. So, um, because we might even be getting into the subcutis right here. There's a few adipocytes, but sometimes that they get 
been trapped. But the take home here is, you know, as a clinician, you really need to do a good, a good biopsy to make sure that we don't miss the surface of a DFSP. And, and, and then another pitfall here is that actually the periphery, the rim of a dermatofibroma is CD34 positive. So if you just do a shave of the surface, right, it's going to be CD34 positive. But what we need to see histologically is these sheets of CD34 positive cells in the heart of the lesion. All right. So that is that, um, you know, I think that these three lesions just show you how you have to think through it. And, I, you know, you may have even wanted to throw, I, I would have thrown on some cytokeratins, make sure that that's not an S100 to make sure it's not some neural lesion, um, et cetera. So good. I think we can move on now to the next one. Now we are, let me see if I can orient this. I like to look from top to bottom, not bottom to top. So what we, it's hard to, it's hard to actually orient except that we have a bunch of fat down at the bottom, but um, let's see if I can get it a little better. Yeah. There's the fat at the bottom and the top. I don't know if it's ulcerated or just was cut tangentially or what, but but basically we have a mass of cells in the dermis. Oh goodness, we're stuck with another mass of cells in the dermis. Well, let's let's see if we can find some clues. When we go down, we see these epithelioid and somewhat spindle, but not like the last one. These are truly epithelioid and giant cells with multinucleation and marked hyperchromasia and numerous mitotic figures, just bizarre nuclei. And this just goes on and on and on and on. So what could this be? This could be anything from a melanoma to a really nasty lymphoma to a um, histiocytic derivation lesion. Uh, this could be a rhabdomyosarcoma maybe, but I don't see great striated smooth muscle cells here. Um, so, you know, what do you, what do we have to do? Let's reach into our bag, grab it out. And we throw on the books on this one. We're throwing on everything from multiple cytokeratin markers, multiple melanocytic markers. We're throwing on Desmond to make sure we're not dealing with a leomyosarcoma. And we're throwing on, um, we might even want to throw on some lymphoid markers to make sure that we're not dealing with a, a bizarre lymphoma. Or, and it's all negative. It's all negative except CD10. CD10 is positive, which is which, which can which can be positive in a lot of tumors, but it happens to be positive in this one. So when everything's negative, um, we're stuck with the diagnosis of atypical fibrosanthoma or pleomorphic dermal sarcoma. So that's what this is. All right. So it's along the spectrum of those. And what's the difference between an atypical fibrosanthoma and a pleomorphic dermal sarcoma? Basically, it's infiltration of the subcutis. If they're large and infiltrating the subcutis, that's the number one criteria to bump up an atypical fibrosanthoma into a more poorly prognostic tumor called a pleomorphic dermal sarcoma. And some these were formally termed not so many years ago, an undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma. Um, but the now, now the new term is pleomorphic dermal sarcoma. So, um, you know, how do these behave? Well, when, when, they in, when they involve the subcutis, as this one does, I mean, it's essentially touching or involving the subcutis, frankly. Um, you know, these can metastasize and they have a much higher local recurrence rate than a typical atypical fibrosanthoma, all right? So that's the atypical fibrosanthoma pleomorphic dermal so sarcoma um, spectrum, all right? And, and so, so from, you know, pearls and take homes and how can you make the diagnosis of a, of a pleomorphic dermal sarcoma if you don't have subcutis? The answer is you can't. So when you, if you do a superficial shave and you get back the diagnosis of atypical fibrosanthoma, a lot of people just kind of do a, you know, you should do a pretty good excision. Some people do a, a, a more conservative excision and then 
and then when they get their their second path report back it, they've upgraded the pathologist has upgraded it to a a, a pleomorphic dermal sarcoma because now they've been able to see it infiltrating the subcutis all right just a few take homes on that lesion um let's see some other criteria differences so we talked about the infiltration of the subcutis as as a criteria for pleomorphic dermal sarcoma. In the literature, they also talk about um, if there's uh, broad zones of tumor necrosis, lymphovascular invasion, or perineural invasion, then it can also be upgraded to a pleomorphic dermal sarcoma instead of an atypical fibrosanthoma. All right, so that's that. I think we've hit just about every point we need on that. Case number five. Here we have, um, here's the epidermis over here. And we can see that we have this big, big tumor expanding the dermis and, and impinging upon the subcutis. And when we go down to look at it in greater detail, we can see these lobulated um, areas of fascicular spindled cells with broad zones of necrosis. When we go down a little farther, we can see that they're epithelioid and spindled and fascicles, and some of them are just dying. These cells are dying here. So see, here's some dead, dead neoplastic cells. So there's, these are broad zones of necrosis. All right. So what is our differential? Well, you may say, well, I see necrosis and I see atypia and I see epithelioid and spindled cells. What about a, a AFX or a pleomorphic dermal sarcoma, just like our last one? Well, we don't see the bizarre nuclei like we did in the last one, okay? So I would certainly not be favoring that, but let's say we threw on all our markers and they were all negative, then you know what? That's still in the differential. Um, but in this case, so we're gonna have to, let's reach into our bag, pull them all out, throw on our melanocyte markers, they're negative. We could throw on a few lymphoid markers, make sure these aren't uh, atypical lymphocytes or histiocytes. We could throw on CD68, it's all negative. But you know what? In this case, EMA, so EMA is positive and low molecular weight cytokeratins such as CAM 5.2 and 818 are positive. Whereas the high molecular weight ones um, like cytokeratin 903 are negative. And this would be very typical of an epithelioid sarcoma. So what is an epithelioid sarcoma? Well, this is basically an EMA and low molecular weight cytokeratin positive epithelioid atypical tumor with broad zones of necrosis. That's your major criteria for it. And it's often on the extremities of young people, all right, or younger, I should say. Not, not children, but you know, in 20s and 30s. So big mass on the arm, epithelioid sarcoma. Right. Case six. I love this case actually because this illustrates what we started with. We can actually figure out what this one is on histologic grounds alone. We don't need our grab bag of of immunostains. So we have a tumor. We have a tumor bulb expanding down here. But then when we go down on moderate power, we see that we also have tumor cells right in here, and they're spindled with these. Uh, at, at first blush, looks like vacuoles, okay? And as we come down to our interface with our more cellular area, we see that we have atypical cells with, we'll have some mitotic figures, some multinucleated. The mitotic, er, the nuclei range from, you know, some are this size to four times that size with irregular nuclear contour, hyperchromasia, a few mitotic figures. Um, Let's go see if we can figure out what these cells are from here. So when we're at low power here, we see these multi or excuse me, multi cells here with these um, almost like vacuoles, but that's not, that's fat. So these, these cells are trying to recapitulate fat cells. And one clue to a fat cell is you have the big vacuole, the big vacuole and it pushes the nucleus to the side right there. See that pushing it to the side. And then that's the, the adipose, that's the, that's a lipocyte right there. Okay. And then when you have atypical cells with multiple 
vacuoles in them, then that is a lipoblast. Okay, so so here we have we can tell that this is a liposarcoma. Okay, so here's if this the whole tumor were like this, we'd call this like a moderately differentiated liposarcoma. Okay, but when we come over to here, this is a dedifferentiated liposarcoma because it's hard to tell what these cells are anymore, right? If we didn't have the next door neighbors, although the astute person would see, here's a, here's a lipoblast right here, okay? So do, does immunostains have a, a role in these? Well, they're S100 positive, but, but there's really not a melanocytic lesion that, that looks like this with, with, the, with the adipocytes, okay? So, so immunostains don't have a huge role in the diagnosis of liposarcoma, but um, it's, these are S100 positive and two other stains is MDM2 and CDK4. Sometimes you'll read a report those, I would doubt they would be on your, those two would be on your derm boards, but, but those, uh, definitely S100 is fair game here. So with, with liposarcomas, you have everything from a spectrum of well differentiated that just looks like normal fat. Sometimes like, and this is out of the realm of derm path, but if you have a huge mass of well differentiated lipocytes in the abdominal cavity, that's completely abnormal. That's by definition a well differentiated liposarcoma. Whereas if you have the same thing in the skin or the, or, or, or excuse me, the, the subcutis or, or impinging upon the dermis, then that's just a lipoma. So some of it has to do with location, but um, uh, you know, you have everything from well differentiated liposarcomas to the de differentiated like you have here or poorly differentiated liposarcoma. All right, let's move on. Case number seven, we have a, um, it's hard to say exactly where dermis is and where, if we're, if we're all in the subcutis, but most likely this is dermis here. And then we have some subcutis. So we're probably at the dermal subcutis junction and we have expansion of the dermis by a process. And then when we go down, we, it's pretty hypocellular. So we have a few cells here, are these fibrocytes, are they some histiocytes, but, but notably we have these, these, um, these structures here. Some of them are serpentine and, and bro broken up into clusters here. And, you know, we have to figure out what that is. Is that collagen? Is that elastin? Um, is it an infectious organism? I doubt it because uh, we would expect to see more inflammatory cells if it were. But when we throw on uh, our stains, we can we can stain this with a like a Verhoff van Giesen stain, a VVG stain, and it would be positive for elastin. So those are actually elastin fibers. And when you see them in these serpentine configurations with these little bubbles on them and then broken, um, that's completely abnormal, all right? And then when you see it as a mass, then what we're dealing with is an elastofibroma. So this is a benign, poorly differentiated tumor. It's usually in the subscapular region and it's composed of, of collagen, which is right here, all right? And coarse elastin fibers that are serpentine and broken up, all right? So this is an elastofibroma. And um, this is also a synonym for this would be elastofibroma dorsi. All right, these are usually, um, you know, middle-aged to older, um, oftentimes male, and they're sometimes associated with hard labor. And so sometimes they're uh, more common on the right side, you know, right-handed labor. Um, so, but that's not to say that these are entirely reactive. I mean, it, it's, it's a, I, I like to consider this, and this isn't going to be on your boards or anything. It's, it's a, it's an abnormality of the fascia system, if you will. So the collagen and elastin, and fibrocytes are, are, are behaving abnormally and, and causing a mass-like lesion. Case eight, well, this one looks very similar. So we're gonna go down and we gotta figure out, is this collagen, is it elastin? Is this some sort of, is this amyloid? Maybe it could be amyloid. Is this, um, are, are these neoplastic cells down in here? What's going on? And when we go down, we don't see hardly any cells. So this is almost acellular. So, you know, you see a few fibrocytes in here, but basically we have 
thickened abnormal um, collagen. All right, so so this is uh, and 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 you know we don't see any elastin fibers like we saw in our elastofibroma. So what could this be? Well, let's look at the history. Let's say that this was um, uh, the upper back or neck region of a kind of poorly formed mass. Well, this is a nuchal fibroma, all right? So the, the, these are uh, bundles of thick collagen and fibers of the, usually the posterior neck, upper back region. Um, synonyms of this are collagenosis nuchi, uh, uh, nuchal fibro. Uh, what is it? Nuchal fibrocartilaginous um, pseudotumor. So uh, all these things, but but basically um, uh, these are fibromas composed of collagen, and, and these are identical to what you could see in a Gardner-associated fibroma if it weren't on the neck. So it's 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 a myofibroblastic abnormality of collagen production leading to a mass-like lesion. So it's not really a uh, a cell derived tumor, it's more of a fascial system derived tumor where the, 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 the end product of what the cells are trying to produce is, the, is forming the mass. So it's kind of interesting. Um, and these uh, board, so I like to, I like y'all to get some good board points here. These are associated with diabetes um, about 45% of the time. All right, so in summary, this is a non-encapsulated hypocellular collagenous um, deposition. And uh, if it were, if it's on the neck, then we call it a nuchal fibroma. If it's elsewhere, then we can call it a fibroma if, um, uh, or even a collagenoma. And, and if it were hamartomatous and, and they can be, as, if they're elsewhere, then they're Gardner associated, but when they're on the neck, they're not Gardner associated, but they're oftentimes diabetes associated, all right? Case number nine, this is an entity that gives a whole lot of grief to pathologists, I can tell you that. So um, we basically see subcutis here, fat being replaced by this ill-defined, almost spider-like infiltrating lesion of, of nondescript spindle cells with some hemorrhage and some lymphocytes admixed in. And here you have like a, I would term a moderate amount of nuclear atypia. Um, you'll see mitotic figures in these. Okay, so the question is, is this benign, malignant, what is it? Well, guess what? This isn't much different cytologically than the first case, case number one, which ended up being a squamous cell carcinoma. So, and then case number two, which was a spindle cell melanoma. So we have to reach into our bag, pull everything out, throw on the cytokeratins, they're negative, throw on the melanocytic markers, negative, throw on a couple of muscle markers, Desmond negative, smooth muscle actin positive in this case. Hmm, that's interesting. Was it truly smooth muscle? Because a lot of tumors are smooth muscle actin positive, but they're more of a, of a, 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 a uh, fibrocyte de derived. So, because the fibrocytes often contract in, in healing, so they have some, some contractile properties to them. All right. Um, so, when we do that, this one happens to be smooth muscle actin positive. And um, this, this is nodular fasciitis. Okay. So, we have, and, 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 and the reason this gives people so much grief is because it is somewhat infiltrative and there is a moderate degree of atypia and there are mitotic figures, all right? But it's just an entity to be aware of. And when, when you throw on all those markers and they're all negative except for smooth muscle actin um, and, and also calponin, which is another muscle marker, but they're Desmond negative, then you can be pretty confident this is uh, nodular fasciitis, all right? And, and, and basically this is a benign self-limited neoplasm of fibr fibroblastic and myofibroblastic proliferation. So that's, that's why they have some muscle derivation markers to them. Um, um, 
for for th these used to be thought to be reactive so they thought that they were kind of related to dermatofibromas or secondary to trauma and all that stuff but actually they do contain genetic abnormalities and oftentimes have a fusion of and this is for your boards you just have to memorize it myh9 usp6 fusion all right and sometimes you end up doing that to make the diagnosis but but um you know uh it's just one of these lesions that you have to get an eye for and realize what's going on. And, and, and um, what, what are some of our differentials? I think we already talked about it. Uh, 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 DFSP, we didn't talk about that actually. A DFSP would actually be CD34 positive. So this is 34 negative. Um, this could be a, a, a deep dermatofibroma. Um, that's gonna be basically factor 13a positive but it will be smooth muscle actin negative so that that's going to help us differentiate the two on there all right so tough lesion this is tough for practicing pathologists um it's going to be tough for you for a while until you just kind of get the eye and get used to them but nodular fasciitis okay case 10 so here we have um upper skin up here and we have the dermis replaced by this Again, a broad spindle cell proliferation. And when we go down, it's, it's again, some of our nondescript spindled cells. Um, let's look at the junction with the, the more normal dermis up here. See if we can get there a little faster here. Yeah, we don't see the collagen and trapping that we would see in a dermatofibroma, all right? And also on low power, it's multi-lobulated. See this? A dermatofibroma is usually not multi-lobulated like that. So here's better. See how it's multi-lobulated? Dermatofibroma actually kind of at the junction will infiltrate a little more like this and not like this, okay? And so I don't think this is dermatofibroma. Also, we don't see the dimple, dimple sign up here. So what do we do? Well, um, we need to throw on our stains, okay? And um, these, this one's going to be cytokeratins negative, muscle marker, Desmond negative, but it is smooth muscle actin positive, all right? But it doesn't look like nodular fasciitis. It's actually less cellular than nodular fasciitis and not infiltrating and almost like that spider-like pattern. Um, smooth, so it's smooth muscle actin positive, doesn't quite look like uh, nodular fasciitis. And... Another one that we would throw on them is called beta catenin, and this is positive for beta catenin. So smooth muscle actin positive, beta catenin positive, lobulated tumor of spindled cells and fascicles. Some people say they kind of look like school of fish. See how these look like kind of fish swimming this way, and then they'll change directions like a school of fish does. Um, so this is a desmoid tumor or fibromatosis. So Smooth muscle actin positive, beta catenin positive, lobulated, um, replacing the dermis, often extending down into the subcutis, minimal atypia, maybe a few mitotic figures, but not many. Um, and then the school of fish pattern of fascicles, be thinking about a desmoid tumor. And so, so what are these? Um, uh, um, the, these are benign tumors that um, can be associated with Gardner syndrome. So again, this is a Gardner syndrome associated tumor, but they don't have to be, you know, they have different locations. They can be superficial, um, superficial oftentimes in the Palma region, in which case they're fibromatosis, okay? Um, they can be deep in the abdomen, in which case they can cause more problems or they can involve the dermis here. Um, so, so desmoid tumor and fibromatosis kind of synonymous. They can be superficial, they can be deep, kind of the locations have different prognoses um, and, and they can be locally destructive, but they don't metastasize. All right. This is case number 11. Here we have uh, a big lobulated neoplasm and we're coming down and we're looking at it and we have epithelioid cells, almost histiocyte-like. We have giant cells, we have 
multinucleated giant cells with numerous nuclei, almost like osteoclasts. So those are osteoclast-like giant cells, we would call those. And if I tell you that this is occurring near a joint on the hand, um, that would be your clue to a giant cell tumor of the tendon sheath, which is exactly what it is, this is. So when you start to see um, histiocytoid epithelioid cells and you see multinucleated giant cells, be thinking, especially on the boards of a giant cell tumor of the tendon sheath. And these are benign uh, semi-circumscribed proliferation of these mononuclear cells admixed with the osteoclast-like giant cells. There's often gonna be foamy histiocytes in here. And, and another thing that you'll read about is hemosiderin um, deposition and some uh, hemosiderin-laden macrophages. And I did see some in here when I was initially screening. I'm having a hard time finding it now. Um, let's see. So hemosiderin, there it is right there. Here's the hemosiderin. So hemosiderin laden macrophages, what is hemosiderin? Hemosiderin is a breakdown product of, 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 of hemoglobin, okay? So you'll actually will see little micro hemorrhages in these sometimes too. Um, so mononuclear cells, hemosiderin, micro hemorrhages, osteoclast-like giant cells, location near a joint, giant cell tumor of the tendon sheath. All right. And our final case for the day. Let's get this up right here. All right, so on low power, we have a nice punch. We have the epidermis dipping down here, almost being pulled down by a neoplasm right here. So that's the dimple sign, all right? You don't see it very often histologically like this, but that's what you see clinically, all right? And then when we go down, we see epidermal hyperplasia, almost some hyperpigmentation at the base of the reedy ridges. And then we come down and we see these thickened bundles of collagen entrapped by these spindled cells here that are um, moderately atypical, I would say. Um, you might find an occasional mitotic figure, you might find an occasional um, multinucleated giant cell. And, oh, but what's going on here? So we were just convincing ourselves that this was a dermatofibroma, right? I was giving you all the clues for a dermatofibroma. But when we come to this area right here, we see bizarre atypia, almost like you'd see in, in an AFX or a pleomorphic dermal sarcoma. Okay, so gosh, what do we do here? We have what appears to be a dermatofibroma, um, but it's got a lot of atypia. So this is a, a, a subjective area of pathology and um, you know, you've got on, on one side of the thing spectrum is a dermatofibroma. On the other side of the spectrum would be what we call an atypical fibrous histiocytoma, okay? And sometimes you'll just see a plug of these without the typical dimple sign or whatnot. And sometimes people just call those histiocytomas. So a fibrous histiocytoma. So you've got dermatofibroma, fibrous histiocytoma, and then atypical fibrous histiocytoma spectrum. So when you start seeing atypia like this, um, that most, most in hypercellularity, most dermatopathologists would term this a um, atypical fibrous histiocytoma. And what does that mean? It's, you know, you're not gonna get great um, agreement among pathologists uh, about the criteria for this lesion. Some, some people would still just call this a dermatofibroma with monster cells, okay? Um, others would call it an atypical fibrous histiocytoma and recommend excision because when they have um, cytology like this, they do have a higher rate of recurrence, okay? Um, and, and rarely, rarely you'll see, re read case reports or someone give a lecture and show a metastatic lesion. But I, I, I certainly don't want to scare you here that, that to tell your patients that these are gonna metastasize and whatnot because it's vanishingly rare, but, but um, um, you know, when we go to the edge of it, it looks just like a great dermatofibroma with the collagen trapping of these and thick collagen fibers. See that here? And it's very characteristic, thick collagen fibers entrapped by the neoplastic cells, all right? And, 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 you know, we would also probably want to confirm that th this is a dermatofibroma slash atypical fibrocystiocytoma by putting on some immunostains, making sure that we're not missing 
some sort of uh, spindle cell melanoma. So I would throw on some cytokeratin markers and I would throw on um, um, some melanocyte markers to make sure that we're not missing anything here that could behave worse. But but most people would term this an atypical fibrocysticytoma and recommend a re-excision if it's going to the margins given this atypia. Although, honestly, some dermatopathologists would 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 just call it a dermatofibroma with monster cells. So, so that that, that that's a quick tour of of some 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 easy and some very difficult fibrohistiocytic and sarcomatous lesions. And and I, and, and I just always want you to think about these things logically. Look at them, you know. The, at first blush, you're going to get stuck with spindle cell lesion in the dermis and go, oh, nut, nuts, what do I do? Well, look around, see if you can find some, some, see if you can find a carcinoma next door, see if you can find uh, lipoblasts or lipocytes next door. Is it, is it a, is it a, is it a liposarcoma? You know, and, and then um, see if you can find a melanoma in situ. Um, and, and then remember, you've always got your grab bag of immunostains and on the boards, they're going to, they're going to steer you in the right direction, you know. So, so um, by giving you the this is positive or this is negative and whatnot. So, um, uh, one thing that I wanted to talk about here was we, we briefly touched on it, but the periphery of a dermatofibroma can be CD34 positive. So, I need you to be very careful about how to interpret CD34 positive positivity in a lesion such as this. Okay, notice it's not infiltrating the subcutis like you'd seen a DFSP, all right? Another clue here is DFSPs don't have this much atypia, all right? But if we put a CD34 on this, it is going to be positive around these areas right here that I'm circling, okay? So it can't be overinterpreted, but right here it would be negative, all right? If this were a DFSP, we would expect a little less atypia, ironically, infiltration of the subcutis, and diffuse strong CD34 positivity of the heart of the lesion. All right, it's gotta be in the heart of it. Um, um, so I, I think with that, we've hit uh, all of our, our major points that we need to hit on these. You've, you, you know, you've gotten some, at least two or three board, board questions here. Um, um, and and, I, and I, I hope you enjoyed it. All right, if you have any uh, questions, feel free to, um, get in touch with me. I'm here at Sages anytime. You can email me um, and, and we'll try to answer any of your questions. All right. If that's it, uh, everybody have a great day. Okay. Take care. Bye. I want to thank uh, Trey for uh, doing such an excellent job there. Uh, one point that he spoke to uh, as well, you know, a lot of these soft tissue tumors or spindled neoplasms do require uh, immunohistochemical staining to uh, determine histogenesis and, and to classify them so that, again, we can prognosticate. Um, when we do order these immunostains, we tend to order them in panels. And so you do look at the sections, come up with the differential, and then order the appropriate panel of stains. We did have one question, um, Kelsey did, about differentiating nodular fasciitis from spindle cell lipoma. And uh, I was having a hard time accessing the slide deck. So I'll tell you, they, they can look a lot alike, okay? With a spindle cell lipoma, one tends to have three components, okay? You, you're going to have mature adipocytes. You're going to have ropey collagen. And you're going to have spindle cells embedded in a somewhat mixoid stroma. And if you go back and look at the nodular fasciitis, it lacks, in this case, the ropey collagen, uh, the clusters of mature adipocytes. This is the, the nodular fasciitis was in the fat. And then the uh, it did have spindle cells, but the spindle cells and the spindle cell lipoma usually are not quite as tapered on the end. They don't quite have that fibroblast and tissue culture look. Um, the difficulty with spindle cell lipomas is that the uh, amount and distribution of those three components, the ropey collagen, the spindle cells, and adipocytes can vary tremendously, either within a tumor or from tumor to tumor. So you can have um, very lipomatous spindle cell lipomas, and then you can also have low fat and fat-free spindle cell lipomas where you hardly have any mature adipocytes. The architecture is a little different too. You know, most of them are large tumors, 
situated in the fat and the uh, back of the neck and the upper extremity are particularly common locations. So anyway, hope, hopefully that answers your question. Uh, and thank you guys for participating. Any other questions that come up, please feel free to send them our way. Hope everybody has a nice evening. Thank you, Cindy.